was that you can do it, but anyone else was doing it. Hi, um, I haven't done one of these for a few days. I meant to do them nearly every day, um, but I don't want to make this a great big burden on myself. I uh, should recap that I'm doing uh, five star reviews on Amazon as a way of creating a bit of good karma after someone left a one star review for my book, Psalms for the City. And um, I've had other reviews, they're all very nice, but that one um, kind of annoyed me. And I thought the best way to get over my being annoyed was just to leave some five star reviews for some other books that I really love. So that's what I'm doing. I'm also going to um, mention a couple of things that I've got going on elsewhere. Um, and I'm going to finish this session with a little bit of what I call desktop pilgrimage, um, <clears throat> which is, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of wandering around on Google Street View. And I hope that that will come up as a result of my um, thinking about this thing that I'm doing for the Amazon book review. Here's the Amazon book review. This is the book I made that I'm going to do. It's called George Perrick. That's George Perrick. And that's his cat. And the author is David Bellos. And uh, so I've done um, up till now the previous live stream Amazon book reviews um, have helped me to come up with an idea about like what are the rules for this thing. And I think one of the rules is it shouldn't be people who I know. Uh, I was very tempted this morning. I thought, oh, I know, I'll do that book by so and so. And I thought, no, because if I do one by someone I know, then I might feel bad if I don't do others by people I know. The point, I think, of this series is to leave five star reviews for books that have been really influential on me. And at least some of the influence has been on what went into this, um, which is a book of uh, poems and illustrations, poems and illustrations by me about um, the city where I live, which happens to be London. And uh, the book is written after having a breakdown. So the kind of things that I'm writing about tend to be to do with breakdown, recovery, illustration, poetry, being an author, living in London, those kinds of things. The first one I did was of John Burningham's book, He's an Illustrator, and it was a sort of lifetime overview of his career. Um, so that was just because I love John Burningham. Then I did a review of 52 ways to of looking at a poem by Ruth Padell. I think I've got the title right. Why not have done? Then I did um, How to Make a Journal of Your Life by Dan Price. So this today is the fourth one. And here we are, Georges Perrick by David Bellos. I like this one so much that I actually... Let me just share my screen for a second. Uh, I actually drew that picture of the book and um, so we can see the similarity. It's got this funny thing down here. That's because I had a pen tucked inside the pages. So there's a little gap there down in the book. Uh, I quite often draw books that I like. So there we are. That's um, one little screen sharey thing. I'm going to keep this relatively short because, to be perfectly honest, because I'd like to go and watch the football match a bit later. It's the World Cup at the time of speaking. And um, I dare say, if anyone's watching this live, they may want, to, you may want to watch the football. Who knows? It's an England match and I live in England. So, uh, what has been happening with these is because I've been making them up as I go along. And in the background, what, what's going on in the background of my life at the moment is I've just been running a writer's course for would-be writers. I'm a writer and an illustrator, and I've had a number of books out, and so hooray, that, lucky me. And I, I also help other people who want to do that. So I thought I should mention some of the things that are going on in the background, which are the thought that one of the ways to get anything done and out there is just to get it out there, whether it's good or not, whether it's 
perfect or not, because it's never going to be perfect. It's only going to be slightly less perfect with a bit more revision. Uh, slightly less imperfect with a bit more revision. Otherwise, you're revising them. Um, so having told all these would-be writers that they might want to start creating things and putting them out there, I thought I would do that, but I'm not writing it. I'm doing these live streams. So deeply imperfect as they probably are, I wanted just to put them out. So one of the things I wanted to share is, um, is about this thing itself. So um, what, what I'm doing right now. So I, I wrote a blog post about doing writing reviews on Amazon because I was cheesed off about getting a negative review. And there are some of them. This is my website. So you can click to see some of the other ones. Then also over here, uh, I wanted to show on the home page of my website, I've just redesigned it. So as well as this hello, it's got loads of stuff here about the way that I'm working with basically writers, storytellers. A one to one session you can have with me for 15 minutes if you want to write a book and you're serious about writing a book, you can just put that on there. So if you click this, it goes to a thing here which tells you more and then you can book a slot. Um, and then various other things, but one I, I won't mention them all, but this one I'm really pleased with. It's a, it's a weekly webinar, live webinar with me on Zoom, so you can communicate with me on Zoom. And it's about making books out of single sheet of paper, believe it or not, and then turning one of those into a bigger thing. So here is um, here is a, a selection of those books which have been bound together and then with a wraparound cover. So this is very rudimentary, but it's but it is a book, and it's a, a first version of the book. So I'm doing those on Monday afternoons at. 4.30 p.m. And if you want to catch those, you need to register on the, on, the on, on this. You have to register to get into the webinar, which is there. Okay, so the next one is Monday, November the 28th. And there's another one regular Monday. I mean, every Monday at 4.30. And you can watch the catch-ups if you register, if you missed the last one. So don't want to go on and on and on and on about all of that, but there we are, that's that thing. And now, and now we're going to Georges Perec, A Life in Words, the book that I've just shown you. It says you last purchased this item on the 19th of May, 9th of May, 2020. That is in fact the only time I've purchased this item. So now I'm going to stop sharing. And what I seem to be doing on these live streams is just flicking through the books that I like and thinking about some of the things that I've usually made marks about so I write on them and maybe little comments and things um, you see that I've underlined stuff that's how I find what I am most curious about now did I do that with this Maybe I didn't all that much, but the thing that I want to just basically tell you is it could be really funny. And one of the ways that he was funny was um, it's probably um, a bit of a stereotype, but people might say this is a kind of blokey, boyish sense of humour. But one of the ways he made fun of things was just to... Um, to be funny was to make jokes and misspell things and mispronunciations and distort things and also uh, mix up words at random. So they're very playful with words. And also, I, I, I love this because one of the jobs that he had early on was simply typing up academic research, but he used to do things like that. He would type it up. And bear in mind, he was doing this on, a, on an old fashioned typewriter. He would type it up playfully into funny shapes like that. It takes quite a lot of thinking, that kind of thing. So what he was doing was making patterns out of text. And that's very much how his mind works. And he, he, it says here, 
Perrett hardly ever typed anything straight the first time off. He would always put in his own red herrings, puns, irreverent asides, fancy layouts, subversions of every imaginable kind. It was a waste of time, of course, but it amused him. Um, he submitted these in his job. This is like a civil service kind of job. And then the boss would always say, do it again, Perrett. And he would say, do it again, but do it this time properly. And Perrett would go off and do it like properly. So the point that I'm making is that he was being really playful in that way, even when he was um, not well known as a writer and when he had this full time job. But um, that kind of way of being playful continued throughout his um, writing career. He would do um, he really, really liked to have a, a rigid constraint on his writing, something or other that would, would that would make his writing have to turn out um, in a certain way. So the classic example of that is he wrote a novel without using the letter E, which is as hard to do in French as it is in English. And... Um, for a long time, I heard about that when, yeah, years and years ago. As you can see, I'm not a teenager, and, and I heard about that when I was a teenager. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of like funny and everything, but I don't want to read that. And why would you do it? And isn't it a bit stupid and pointless? But actually, one of the things that I found out from this book about Perrick is the background story of his life. His family came from Poland moved to France just before the Second World War. His father joined the armed forces and one of, was one of the very few people in the French armed forces who actually died defending Paris because um, as soon as the Germans got near Paris, the fighting stopped. So very unfortunate that Georges Perec's father would die in that very small window early on. But then on top of that, his mother was taken away and died in one of the German concentration camps. Now, this is this is relevant to the book that doesn't have the letter E. If you um, bear in mind that that book, uh, in French, it's called La Disparition, which means the disappearance or the, or the um, yeah, the disappearance. La Disparition, the disappearance. And that actually, as I found out from reading this book, that is the name of the document, Act de Disparition, the, the document which after the war was sent to Perrick to confirm that his mother had officially disappeared. And because of getting that document, um, certain kinds of um, support, you know, state support would be available to people who lost their parents that way and so on. But it's an, obviously a really important document in a man's life, the one that says, yes, your mother disappeared. And also maybe there's a way of saying, a way, a way of thinking that having no mother and having lost his father as well, just when he was a little boy, um, is a bit like, struggling through life is a bit like writing a novel without the letter E. So there is a, there is a, there, there's a real sense to what the heck's going on. Um, however, so there's a real there's a real underlying um, sense to this playfulness that is important to me to say that, but it's also brilliant that he also just came up with so many structures for writing, and so I, I'm not even ugh, I'm never going to find them all because I, I underlined a lot here, but I didn't actually write everything down. He was in the Guinness Book of Records for the longest um, palindrome ever. What does that mean? It's a, oh gosh, this is so, this is so good. If you write um, a palindrome, then it has to be, it has to make sense back to front. So um, it's quite hard to even to begin doing that at all. It's really hard. If you think about it, if you sit down with a pen at some point, try to work it out. You'll see, let me just see if I can find a bit about the palindrome. Palindrome, four to eight to four thirty. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks for bearing with me. Yeah, it's going to be the football match soon. Um, the Great Palindrome. The thing is with a palindrome is that it, so like mum, the English word mum, M-U-M, is a palindrome because it works back to front. To be worth doing, it says, to be truly worth doing, a palindrome would have to be longer than anything contemplated in mere jest. The constraint, i.e. writing something that, that has to make sense back to front as well, the constraint tightens not in arithmetical proportions of the length, but geometrically, logarithmically, exponentially, perhaps even asymptotically. Because every letter that is added to the text that must be re readable both forwards and in reverse forces a reconfiguration of everything that came before. So let's take the thing mum. If you try to add one letter at the beginning, then everything that goes before has to still balance. That's not going to work. Peric's Great Palindrome is about, guess how long, like 25 letters, 30 letters, whatever. Um, no, Peric's Great Palindrome is about 500 words long in each direction. And it earned him a place in the Guinness Book of Records. For that alone, I would say that's just like brilliant. So here's another example. Okay, it's not um, what's uh, this book points out is that Perrick didn't write a, a so-called perfect palindrome, which says exactly the same thing in both directions. Like, for example, Madam, I'm Adam. If you reverse it, it still says Madam, I'm Adam. But what Perrick wrote was a twin palindrome, which has a certain sense this direction. And then if you turn it around, it, it, it still makes sense, but it's not the same in both directions. But 500 words long, can you? even begin to make sense of that. The Great Palindrome must have been the very hardest of texts to write, and it's undeniably difficult to read. When you know it's a palindrome, you tend to see nothing but the palindromic design. But in Manchester in 1989, unsigned handwritten versions were given to students and teachers of French who were asked respectively to use it for the exercise of explaining a text as you do when you're a language student and to mark it as if it was an essay. Perrick's palindrome barely made sense to the readers. Some teachers took it for the work of an incompetent student while others suspected they'd been treated to a surrealist text. Those with a psychiatric interest identified the author as an adolescent in a dangerously paranoid state. <laughs> Those who had not forgotten the swinging 60s wondered if it was LSD or marijuana that generated the disconnected images of the text. Either way, readers seem to project their own positive and negative fantasies onto Perek's palindrome. So, um, there's a really lovely paradox at the heart of everything about George Perek and the way that he approached writing. And David Bellos sums it up beautifully. Perrick felt profoundly liberated by the constraints he imposed on his writing. Anyway, um, I'm going to bring this back very quickly to, to the reason why I'm doing it. And um, that once his, his novel, Life, A User's Manual, is based on a very complicated mathematical procedure by which he makes his way around every room in that building using a chess move, like a knight, like a horse knight's move in chess. So, you know, you go, you go two up and then one to the side, two up and one to the side, that's chess. So somehow he had to use the chess move just to move around every room in that building and tell the stories of the people in the building. It's like, why, why, not, why, why tell the story that way? It's just so completely bonkers. But he was just, absolutely in love with that stuff and reading this book made me understand why that bizarre way of thinking kind of is really wonderful actually and i really my heart went out to george perrick 
Um, after reading this, in fact, I'm going to read it again soon. I'm going to flick through it again because it's a bit un, unfresh for me. But one of the things that he came up with did influence this book. Perrick, or one of his friends, but certainly the people who he hung out with, and probably him, came up with a structure for writing things, which was to take a sentence and and um, use only the capital letters of the main the main um, substantive, the nouns and, and the verbs and, and the main things. So not the or of, but but the, the the key words to a sentence. So I I used that structure in in my book. I'll, I'll read it. It's one of the poems. And this book's called Psalms for the City. So it's not the Psalms from the Bible. It's my version, but. But this one is basically, it's a game by George Perrick. The L is my S, I shall not W. If you've ever come across the Psalms in the Bible, you, you probably know the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So that's what I took as a sentence. I was writing Psalms for the city. I knew they weren't going to be my Psalms, but I knew people would be thinking of the Psalms. So um, I wanted to I wanted to borrow a structure and Perrick leapt into my mind. And that's why I'm doing this book review on Amazon. Gosh, I'd better get on with it. It's going to be the football any second. So the L is my S, I shall not W. Instead of the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I wrote, the lawn is my square mile, I shall not wander. The lifestyle is my shackle, I shall not whistle. The limited is my shame, I shall not whitewash. The litter is my shadow, I shall not waste. The lyric is my shiatsu, I shall not wince. The link is my shortcut, I shall not wait. The loft is my St Paul's, I shall not whine. The laugh is my shalom, I shall not withhold. So that poem, which I have now um, read is largely inspired by George Perrick, an incredibly playful man whose play seemed to be really brought out by, by um, structural uh, limits and constraints. And um, I think I'm gonna keep my review really simple. I'm not gonna try and do something really super comprehensive. I'm just gonna go on to the... Um, you can now see Amazon, go to the ratings, write a customer review. I'm not going to read what anyone else said. Most does. Um, human knowledge makes, shows the humanity of a writer who can seem who might otherwise seem abstract and even calculating. Okay, now just, I knew I was gonna be asked for a photo, so what I'm gonna do is actually, I'm gonna upload my drawing just for a change. Um, Um, years ago, I came across Perry. The work of Georges Perec, and I smiled at the seeming balminess of his work aims. His decision to write but although it amused me, I was left. It's cold. It seemed 
silly, even stupid. David Beros is, hmm, what do I do here? Something's come up on my iPad about, um, about this thing, Twitch. How do I, what am I meant to do? Oh gosh. I don't know what's going on here at all. I don't know. No, I ignore that. I don't know. My iPad seemed, me, seemed to want me to do something. David Bellos is... Wonderfully... Come, wonderfully... Wonderful biography. changed that i now see the underlying reasons why eric was drawn to express himself through such torturous devices and i am all the more impressed by what he achieved. The most the less novel called the Look, it's The Edith novel, that is Parisian, to use the original French title, took its name from the document, from the official document, confirming that Perrick's mother was presumed to have died in the Nazi concentration camps. In this light, it makes sense that he might struggle through writing a novel without that crucial letter, just as he is. If that makes it sound terribly serious, it's not. Eric was complex and given to dark moods, also terrifically. This book brought me to see him in the round. Okay, yeah, that'll do. Although I'd better read it out loud again, just in case. Shows the humanity of a writer who might otherwise seem abstract, 
and even calculating. There's the picture. That's actually a that's actually my drawing of the book, not a photo. I hope you don't mind. Years ago, I came across the work of George Perrick, and I smiled at the seeming balminess of his word games, particularly his decision to write a whole novel without the letter E. Which is which is as hard in French as it is in English. Also, how could I not be impressed at his great palindrome? Got him a place in the Guinness Book Records. But although it amused me, I was left a bit cold. These, these achievements seemed silly, even stupid, seemed, seemed silly, pointless. David Bedos's wonderful biography changed how I see that. And now, no, the underlying reasons why Perek was drawn to express himself through such torturous devices, and I'm all the more impressed by what he achieved. The e-less novel, La Disparition, to use the original French title, took its name from the official document confirming that Perek's mother was presumed to have died in the Nazi concentration camps. In this light, it makes sense that he would that he might struggle through writing a novel without that crucial letter just as he would have to struggle through life without his mother. If that makes it sound terribly serious, it's not. Perrick was complex and given to dark moods, but also terrifically funny. This book taught me to see him in the round. Yep, that'll do. Submit. So now Amazon's going to tell me that it's thinking about whether my review is acceptable. So stop sharing. And I said that I was going to do one... Um, thing before I finish. I've got about four minutes before I think the football match starts, which, you know, I really do want to see. But this is a really relevant thing because um, in the run up to Christmas, I'm going to be doing a few bits of um, online pilgrimage, as I call it, where I walk around on Google Street View. I did this in, uh, 20, in lockdown, basically, with people and I'd wander around and look at places. I just want to look at his home because locations and things were really important to Perry. I might have to come back to this. He did all sorts of things where he would go to certain places and then go back to them years later to look again at another, and he would write about them. And so a, this is a whole other thing, one of his patterning things, but I need to find one of the places that came out best. Okay. Okay. That will be on like 27. 27 to 38. This is where their family moved in the at the beginning of the war, then when they came to France. They moved to Belleville. And um the author of this biography points out that a lot of things have probably changed quite a lot, but what I thought I would do is right now, since I'm doing this live stream, Rue Villain. They need to go to Rue Villa. Izzy and Cécile, they're the parents, they're Georges Perrick's parents. Um, Izzy and Cécile lived at number 24, Rue Villa. So that's what we're going to look at right now. Going to do a quick desktop pilgrimage to see um, the home of Perrick. What is, 
one with me, please. So now, Rue Villa, Paris. Come on, let me do this. Oh. It's not letting me do this. So let me just try and search here without doing screen share. Screen share again. I don't know why that seemed to not be coming screen sharing. Rue Villa in Paris. Let's have a look. And then we have to look for number 24. It's probably changed, but here we are. Okay, let's. Um, Zoom right out and look at Europe. So they came from somewhere in Poland, over there. Can't remember where, I'm not going to look it up now. Um, but then they ended up at Rivilla. So it's in the main central circle of Paris. In Belleville, where is that? Oops. Okay, right, yeah, right, okay. Gosh, very good. Me, there's a song by um, Menin Moton. I can't remember the name of the guy, but he's brilliant. No, not Rivia. Menin so I said 24, didn't I? Let's have a look. Okay, this is what I call a little, um, oh, it's all been rebuilt, hasn't it? Look. Oh, no, that's Rue des Couronnes. Let's see, where's Rue Villa? Rue des Couronnes. Rue Moumna. Oh, well, that is. That's interesting. Let's see. Oh, you can't get on to Rivia. I guess that there is Rivia. Yeah, let's have a look. If I go to Rue Julien Lacroix and then look around Rue Julien Lacroix. Yeah, that's uh, kind of pedestrianised, isn't it? So this is Belleville where Georges Perrick lived. You can barely see it because it's all covered up in stickers, but it does say Rue Villa 24, somewhere down here. It's obviously all been rebuilt. Hmm. I didn't know where that is. Look back here. Hmm. Oh, here Rue Villa in the 20th arrondissement. Little pilgrimage to say hello to Georges Perrick, or at least to the place where his parents once lived. Changed now beyond all recognition because it's all been rebuilt, but there we are. Thanks for watching this live stream. I'm going to go and watch the football now. Um, I did mention about the stuff on my homepage and about writing. Well, yeah, I've done all that. Thanks for watching. Bye.